As the, as the uh, title says, connecting with agencies and folks out there that can help um, employ all of our builder members and associate members find the employees and the talent that they're looking for. We know it's a little bit of a struggle from time to time. And um, sometimes we look through just traditional methods, and today, just like the name implies, we want to see how we can connect outside the box. And we're going to hear from some absolutely tremendous agencies who are going to share with you some information. This is supposed to be self-learning, so I'm, I'm hoping also that our panelists learn from each other, too. The whole idea is to learn and, and hear from each other and see how we can work together better um, to help solve some of these issues. So. Um, first of all, before we get going logistically, I know hopefully everybody's found out where the breakfast area is, so please feel free to help yourself in the beverages. By definition, as an HBA, we're pretty informal. So if you have to, you have the need to get more food, and all of a sudden, or you're going to pass out because you don't have enough coffee, feel free to get up and do that. But just be mindful of that we are recording this and that we're of our speakers as well. We'll have uh, so the panelists will speak briefly on each of their areas, and then we'll have some time for Q and A. So we certainly encourage you to be engaged in that respect. So before we get going, I would be remiss every single time if I don't thank the folks that helped put this on. Um, and they're going to come back in. Hannah and Victoria, who are out there greeting with you, uh, greeted you this morning, helped get things set up, uh, helped us get going. And uh, uh, I see Pat back there, who is our social chairman. I always tease her that way, help greeting everybody. So if you're not a member of the HBA, Pat will certainly help you find out, or if you know folks that want to be a, a member of this great organization. And last but certainly not least, I want to thank Jody back there. Wave your hand, Jody. She's pulling all this together is like herding cats, and she's done a remarkable job of herding cats. I don't know if she did it, but we're all thankful that you're here. So. It's my pr privilege, and I'm not going to speak all day because my staff knows I could go for an hour and a half, so and I'll take the whole time up. The irony is that I'm going to start timing people, so that'll be a change. So, um, But it's my great privilege to introduce uh, Ta Dawn Crandall from the Home Builders Association of Michigan. I teased Dawn. I don't know what title she wanted me to use because she wears many hats like most of us do, but today we'll just call her the Executive Director of Skill to Build. And as obviously some of these labor issues that we're dealing with are not just a Grand Rapids area issue. This is a, a Michigan-wide issue. So we're trying to work as well as we can with our state and other agencies to solve this on a bigger picture. So please help me welcome Don Crandall. Good morning. Um, so my name is Don Crandall, and I'm the executive director of Skill to Build Michigan Foundation, which is the nonprofit of the Home Builders Association of Michigan. And how our organization came about, just for a little bit of background in terms of the nonprofit, is um, we worked very closely with Associated Builders and Contractors, the Michigan Manufacturers Association, um, and the Farm Bureau a couple sessions back to change the way the Michigan Merit Curriculum was structured so that students could take career tech education programs, because we were seeing that loss in our industry of skilled trades. So when that, when that was passed and signed into law, I said to our president at the time, who happened to be Rich Kogelschatz from this area, that this is just the beginning. Just because the ink is now dried on this legislation does not mean that students are going to flock to the building trades industries, that schools are going to start creating programs. We needed to create an awareness campaign. So we created being kind of the process of the home builders, we created a workforce task force first, and then we created this nonprofit foundation. And through this nonprofit, what we have done is we've connected with many other groups in, in the community on a statewide basis and worked with schools to help them understand the importance of offering children or students career tech opportunities. <clears throat> we traveled and visited your vocational village, Warden, very impressive. Um, so one of the things that we are working with with our members is to let them know that there are opportunities out there and then to let parolees, to let veterans, and to let students know that currently in the state of Michigan, in the 17 trades that we track, there are over 6,500, no, sorry, 3,600 jobs available as of September, just in those 17 trades, that all are very good paying at the entry level that if you continue to work, you're going you're gonna to do very well without having to have a four-year college degree and not have to have a, a debt coming out of college. We're working with schools because they seem to be a challenge. Counselors don't want to push career tech. They don't want to push building trades because they think it's not the college track. It's not the educational path that students should go on. 
Midland Schools two years ago decided to, and schools and I have different phrases, I say cancel their building program. They say put it on hold, but at the end of the day, if it's not offered, it's kind of canceled. Um, the unfortunate thing about that was we were hearing from students that they wanted to take the program, but counselors were telling them that they really didn't, that that was not the path they should be on. So we um, worked with our local HBA in Midland and we went a little ape on the school superintendent and on the school board president and showed them the error of their ways because the unfortunate thing was there was already a house in planning for a young woman named Ashley who was 22, I believe, who was wheelchair bound. And the house that those students were gonna build was gonna be for Ashley. It was already a done deal and then the school decided to change their mind. At the end of the day, we worked with the schools and they saw the errors of their ways and they built two homes that year. And one was for Ashley. I got to go meet Ashley and I had the opportunity to tour Ashley's home when it was complete. So it's all zero step entry. It's all handicap accessible because Ashley will be in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. And it is an amazing, like I would move in there tomorrow. It's an amazing home. And to see the pride in these kids' faces when they take you through and show you what they have done and, and what they installed and the drywall that they hung and the painting that they did and, and all of that. You know, when we had the discussion on merit curriculum, we had a lot of business community organizations saying we're dumbing down our kids because they can now take Algebra two through a career tech program. They don't have to sit in a classroom and take it. And I said, you know, the, the kids who are gonna do well in Algebra two are still gonna take Algebra two. Like, kids aren't gonna flock to building trades because it gets them out of taking Algebra two. But what, you, what we saw when we met with students was the lifting up of those students who didn't do well in school. In a traditional classroom setting, they didn't feel like they had the opportunity to do well. And you saw these kids excel and soar, and you saw pride in them, and, and it was one of those things where it was a good thing to do. We are also working with Michigan Community Action to work with them as they are looking for um, placing employees with people who are looking. We have created, and I think it's in your packet, and I'm hiring. We survey our members at the Home Builders um, every month to see who's hiring, what the wage is, and we post that on our website. And then we send it out to veterans or students or anybody who has entered into our database as well to let them know that there are jobs available and we update that every month. We also survey our members on what they're seeing in the industry every quarter. And what we see is when there's a lack of skilled labor, the cost of homes go up, jobs don't get completed or they get delayed. And so what we really are trying to push and, and instill in legislators is, is we lobby on this issue on the importance of not having that pendulum swing so far to the right um, under Governor Snyder the first term. Um, God love him, he was all about everybody needed a four year college degree, they needed to be a doctor, they needed to be a lawyer, they, they needed to be a CPA, which I'm fine with. However, when that doctor's pipes burst at three o'clock in the morning and there's one plumber left in this state and they're from Petoskey and they get you know travel time and probably way more money an hour than I make in a year, um, that's not good for our economy. So we're working with, with the governor. He's now a big fan of skilled trades. He wants Michigan to be number one in the nation on skilled trades. Um, and we've seen that switch. They've put more money into career tech programs in the budget and we're very excited to work with Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly as we tour the state and he's been a big promoter of skilled trades as well as an option for returning veterans and for students or people who would like to make a career choice. So we have a lot going on at the state. Um, it's taken off a lot faster than I can keep up with it some days because I also lobby for the home builders on education and skilled trades issues and I'm also their political affairs director. So as you can imagine, this has been a busy week for me. <laughs> um, so the beautiful thing about skilled trades is it's a nonpartisan issue. When you talk to Republicans and Democrats in the legislature, they all believe that skilled trades are important. So moving forward, we have a great opportunity to make some additional changes and things that we would like to see in making it easier for students or for others to get into the industry. The, this legislature has done a lot in making it easier for veterans 
to come into the industry, they've changed and, and have allowed their kind of experience to overrule some of the requirements you need to get in. And so we're fortunate that you have a legislature that, are, that is looking out for skilled trades, but also that wants to help our veterans reintegrate into society and into skilled trades and work with us on how you get students into the trades. We also have actually a high number of our members would hire a parolee. Um, so we're encouraged by that too. So we're, that's kind of our next phase once we get the veterans and the students part kind of settled on a strong foundation is then how do we tap into that, that parolee situation so that we can integrate them back into the community. How's my time, Andy? Yeah, about, you all that, I'll give you three more minutes. Oh, I get three more minutes. <laughs> um, the other thing that we do is we create a newsletter on a, a monthly basis, and, and we really are trying to encourage our members. Uh, school was starting back up in September. I said, school, is, you know, students are going back to school, are you? One of the things we hear from career tech instructors is they can be the best resource for builders. If you have a career tech uh, program in your area, they know who the workers are. I, um, I visit our Capital Area Career Tech Center quite a bit because they're in my backyard. And I've had this conversation with the instructors and, and I have told them who I would hire if, if I was coming in. And they go, of course you would because so and so is a great kid but he'll talk to you all day and he'd be a great salesman but he won't ever produce for you. So what those instructors tell me is the best way is to hook up with those instructors because they will tell you who the workers and the producers are in their class and who will do well. So look at those opportunities that may not be traditionally in your wheelhouse that you think to go to because I will tell you at the end of the day, the industry needs to change a little bit in that if you're gonna hire a student, they're not gonna have all the answers right away. They're gonna be green, they're gonna have some basic knowledge, but you're gonna have to really work with them and mentor them. And what I tell students is if you look at our industry, we're an older baby booming industry. Uh, the average age of our member at the home builder is 57. If you took out our associate members, I would guess that the average age of our builder member is 65. Just my guess. They are not gonna work forever. They're gonna retire, or as I tell students, they're gonna pine box out. And at the end of the day, people are not gonna quit living in homes because builders have retired. And there's also another opportunity for students, I tell them, is if they do well and they find their niche, and I'll tell you a little personal story and then I'll, I'll end and turn it over to the panelists, but. I have aging parents. They're 79 and 77. They live in a 2,200 square foot home colonial in Okemos on three quarters acres. They don't need to be in a two story home. They need to be in a condo that has wide doors, wide entryways to bathrooms, and that are wheelchair and handicap accessible. Try finding that in the Lansing area. I've looked for three months, it does not exist, unless you go into like a senior rehab facility. There's a huge niche for all builders to look at that as our demographics change in Michigan, because not only is our industry an aging industry, our state is an aging industry as well. And if you look at millennials, I was just having this conversation with Andy, millennials are looking for that kind of community as well. They're looking for the open floor plans, the walkable communities, kind of everything in one location. It's kind of a win-win. Um, so there's a market available and there's a great need for that aging in place. I know that in some parts of the states it's taking place. I can tell you in Lansing, not so much. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities for the building industry and I'm very excited to be here today and to hear what all of the experts in these fields have to say because I think we do need to start thinking outside the box and connecting outside the box and making those new relations. With that, I will turn it over. Thanks, Andy. Thank you so much, Dawn. They have a lot of tremendous information out there at skilledtobuild.com, right? Yeah, if you check that out. Skilled, skilled yeah, skilled to build. Am I? Is it? Nope, Michigan spelled out. Spelled out. Okay, but you got it. Skilled to build Michigan. Dot com. Of course, I always just Google things and find it that way too. So you can do it either way. So, anyways, uh, thank you uh, again, Dawn, for your great comments. And I'm looking forward to keep working with you guys and the our great partners across the state to help solve some of these issues. So it's my great pleasure to start begin our next program. And again, I want to really thank everybody for being here. And just is, this is such a new thing for us. I'm really um, excited that everybody's here. I think and we're, we are taping this. So if those folks that couldn't be here because they're so busy, we want to make sure they get the information too. So we've got our first panel here. It's, it's called Innovative Barrier Removing Employment Programs 
and community support. And I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for us, Mike Dykstra, who is the president and CEO of Zealand Lumber, and they're just a phenomenal partner of ours. We're very engaged with uh, CareerQuest. Uh, if you don't know about CareerQuest, we'll probably have a, a commercial for that at some point during this uh, morning session. Why you had over 9,000 uh, students come through that, and it was really a tremendous opportunity. And our good friends at Zealand help us uh, put on a couple activities that really help hopefully spark the interest in the construction trade. So please help me welcome Mike Dykstra. All right. Yeah, there's a spot for it. Great. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Andy and the entire uh, HBA staff for putting together this uh, exciting and, and uh, phenomenally important um, event. And thanks, Don, for all your work in Lansing and, and around the state. Um, what, what exciting times. Um, aren't, we, aren't we all blessed to have more, more demand than supply? Don't we remember in our industry the other side of that coin? Um, so it said, as you build success, you have better problems. I keep telling our staff, these are better problems. And I'm very thankful to be part of this uh, amazing group of people here, and this is going to be just a, a great conversation on, um, on how we can open up our minds and look for uh, alternative sources of hiring that maybe we wouldn't um, look for otherwise. Um, our story a little bit is um, coming out of the recession. Um, we, we were building up our business and trying to meet the demand of the of the area, we are also into uh, not just the lumber and supply business, but also truss and, and wall panel components, which is a, the manufacturing arm of our business. And we were looking at our core values and, and our purpose of our business. And transforming lives and communities kind of came to the top of, uh, of, of the higher purpose of, of our business. And we had this economic need of, of, um, of, of needing um, employees to serve our customers. So the collision of uh, a socially beneficial uh, company mindset and, and the economic need of serving our customers led us in a path to look at alternative hiring sources specifically to the reentry segment. And we have, we have not been at it as, as long as, uh, you know, Butterball Farms and, and other employers locally like Cascade Engineering and so on. But for the last five years, we have We've been on this journey, and uh, it's been a, a phenomenal thing for our company. Um, it's, it's been a, a great thing. We've had uh, now roughly, so we've grown from roughly 120 employees, say, in, in um, 2010 to currently roughly 350 employees. Um, roughly 15% of those employees are from the reentry segment, and it's been a great experience for, for our company. Um, I'm also pleased to be part of this, this uh, morning discussion because uh, Jen Schottke and, and Todd and, and in training and the next generation and everything Don was saying, it's so important because our number one issue that we have with, uh, with the construction industry is the frontline labor. I totally agree. Someone needs to fix those, <laughs> those pipes when they break in the, in the middle of the evening or whenever. And, and the uh, construction trades is, is a major, major constraint. Um, a lot of our builder customers are extending their um, lead times on delivering new homes to their, to their customers. Um, it's, it's having a lot of heartache throughout the whole supply chain, and, it, and it's been a big deal. So having this uh, whole event here is, is very, very inspiring. Um, one industry um, event uh, or, or alliance that came together out of this, and, and it's just, uh, just kind of for you that don't know, but the CWDA is, is called the Construction Workforce Development Alliance. And I've been in this industry 22 years. Typically, associations are close to the vest. You know, the HBA, we do our thing. The ABC Association kind of does their thing, and the ASAM does, does their thing. But they came together several years ago, and Andy and I and a few others are on this, uh, this committee um, where the alliance came together to solve the problem, the common problem we have of construction labor. And um, so it's, it's three associations to market construction um, to, the, to the general community and then to provide training and resources. So anyways, that's, uh, that's on, on our industry. But rather than hearing from me, we'd love to hear from the panelists. And it's, uh, it's just great that everyone's here. Thanks for taking the time, being part of the conversation, and looking at um, you know, non-traditional hiring um, sources. So 
Carrie, why don't we start with you and uh, tell your story on the, uh, you know, both I guess at Butterball Farms and, and uh, what's going on with the, with the 32-2 program. Oh, the, the whole time, right? Or does it stay on? Oh, I do have to hold that. Oh. Ben's going to hold it for me. <laughs> Yay. Team player. That's why I'm here. <laughs> he's, a, he's a good partner at 32, too, also, so, you know. <laughs> yes. So, um, quick backstory on Butterball Farms. We've been hiring returning citizens, and does everybody know what I mean when I say returning citizens? Not soldiers. <laughs> but that's a good, it's, a lot of people think that. So returning citizens, when I use the word returning citizens, I mean people coming out of the criminal justice system. They may be on parole, probation, um, they may have gone to prison, they may have a felony, they may have a misdemeanor, any of the above. And that's kind of become the buzzword or the politically correct term, as opposed to ex-con, ex-felon. We like to stay away from those kind of stigma-induced words, right? So Butterball Farms has been hiring returning citizens for... Pff, 20 plus years. We've never not, um, or never discriminated against anybody in our hiring practices. It was never a cognizant effort where we said, we're going to go and we're going to only hire, you know, people of this segment or this segment. But when we installed um, a piece of machinery in our facility, we had to downsize our workforce by roughly a third. Um, in doing that, we helped everybody who wanted to find new employment find new employment, and we were successful in doing that 100%. However, the people we found the most difficulty in finding a new job were those with a criminal background. And that really led us to this thought of, we've been doing this forever, why can't we encourage others in our community, our, our neighbor businesses or other friends of the company to to engage in this work. So 32.2 was kind of born from that and dubbed the name because our initial goal was to find 30 employers in the area to hire two returning citizens or commit to hiring two returning citizens and track their progress within the organization for two years. Thus 32.2 was born. Over the last two years, we've had great success. We've been able to measure approximately 500 companies in our greater Grand Rapids, West Michigan area who hire returning citizens. We've got 30 community partners, business partners, who are hiring and tracking individuals. And I've got over 1,700 individuals that I can track um, in the area. And what we have found from that, and the whole reason behind doing that, was to measure the, the success of these individuals in the workplace to reduce the stigma, right? That these people are just, they're gonna be late for work all the time, or they're, they're not committed because they came out of the system. And that is just not the case. 45% of our workforce at Butterball Farms are returning citizens, from the office staff all the way down to the entry level people. Um, their tenure is longer than those without a criminal background, and that is the truth across all of the companies that we are working with. They're more dedicated employees, they appreciate the opportunity more, they take advantage of more educational and training opportunities, and many of these individuals are coming in with skills you wouldn't think that they would have, that they've learned from the vocational village or they've learned prior to going in to prison or jail. The truth is that one third of Americans have a criminal background of some sort. Those of us that don't are probably just lucky we didn't get caught doing something. Because quite frankly, <laughs> we've probably all done something, whether minor or not, that we shouldn't have done and could have been caught for, right? So going into an interview with a scarlet letter, because you had to check a box on an application that says, I have a felony, <clears throat> um, even if you don't have a felony or a criminal background, what would you do if you went into an interview and had to say, tell the person interviewing you your most embarrassing moment? And that's how you are now labeled. So at Butterball, we've removed the box from our applications. Um, we do not ask about a criminal history until someone is offered a position within our company. And even when they disclose that information, they're not eliminated from the pool whatsoever. Um, most people find it's 
if they can talk about their past conversationally as opposed to like, what did you do and why did you do it and how can I trust you, they're far more open to share their experiences and then mentor others within the organization. We have one gentleman that works with us who did almost 20 years. Um, he's become one of our best employees. He's risen in the ranks within our organization and he is a great mentor to those new people who might be on work release and able to come to Butterball and work and be given the opportunity. Because the number one, well, there's two of the biggest indicators of recidivism in our community is employment and housing. And 95% of those people in prison and jail are coming back to our communities. So if we can help them with housing and we can help them with employment in a success-oriented environment, it's better for our communities, it's better for the business's bottom line, and it's better for those individuals who can now reconnect with their families, who can pay child support they might not have been able to, and now they get to see their kids again. So it's overall a win-win. So 32-2 was developed to really measure those statistics and make the business case for hiring from this population. They're amazing organizations at the table here who provide some barrier relief and they provide employment and probably half if not more of this panel and those in the room are part of the 32-2 program. Um, but we want the business statistics because when you go to a business leader, especially one who has never considered hiring from this population, they want numbers and they want data. We all have the heartfelt stories and I can sit here for the next hour and a half and tell you stories of people who have reconnected with their kids, who have now become managers, who now have a master's degree, who have done all of these things, but business leaders still want data. So, one minute. So, ultimately over the next two years, we've just started the next two years of our study, um, we have 30 plus employers engaged. We'd love any of you in the room who would be willing to share their data with us. But the biggest thing we're looking at right now is turnover rate over the next couple of years. And I will end on, we were invited to the White House two weeks ago to speak with, Uber was there, Google was there, American Airlines was there. Um, and we sat in a round table discussion with 16 other businesses around the country who have committed to stay together. Um, despite whatever happens in the election, of course it was the current administration that, that invited us um, to do this work around the country. Wow, that's awesome, Carrie. That's a great, great story to be in the, invited to the White House. I mean, that was a great experience. Yes, it's yeah. amazing, it's amazing. Yeah, so key takeaway, you know, returning citizen and, and our mindset and, and, and then the, the business case for it, um, another key point. Um, we went into this without the business case and there was um, people in our organization that were a little more skeptical than say I was and including our board of directors and, and other stakeholders in our business and we said we're going to go down this path um, but to have that business case and and you mentioned the uh, tenure, the training, mindset, turnover, same thing right? All, all good positives. Thanks a ton Kerry. Um, ben uh, Mendoza, what's going on in the criminal justice chaplaincy? <laughs> Kerry, you get to hold the button. You, get to, <laughs> you know, it's always good to follow Kerry because she gives you most of the data, so I, <laughs> so I don't have to, and she does a, she does a good job of it. Uh, my name is Ben Rosa. I work with an, a small faith-based organization uh, here in, in Grand Rapids, uh, criminal justice chaplaincy. And what we do uh, for the last 36 years is working with men and women coming out of uh, prison, usually prison, but also jail. And uh, some of the things that, that I think relate to, to this organization, I won't tell you everything that we do, uh, but we, we're more on the retention part of it. Uh, we provide case management for men and women that are coming, make sure that they're working on uh, uh, getting to work, staying uh, on the job, soft skills kind of thing. We also recruit and train mentors, so we're working with a lot of churches and a lot of, and some companies now, where, where they hire uh, men and women with criminal histories, we want them to identify somebody within the organization so we can come and, re uh, and train uh, the person uh, on, to help this individual, kind of a life coach uh, right on site. So we provide those services uh, to employers right now. 
what we love doing, and we're like Carrie said, we're part of 32-2, and we probably partner with most of the organizations up here. Uh, we don't, like these organizations, we don't try to do everything ourselves. Uh, Kent County is blessed uh, with tremendous resources uh, for individuals that have barriers to employment, uh, criminal history. So what we do is we collaborate with a lot of the organizations. We do some things very well, but we don't do everything. So we'll reach out to individuals, other organizations uh, at this table and others that aren't uh, represented here. And we partner together to make sure that the individuals get the support that they need to not only get a job, but to also keep that job, which is a big part of it. Uh, this is an untapped uh, population. Uh, there's a lot of individuals with criminal histories that just want a second chance at it. And <clears throat> the uh, criminal justice system reform that's going on in, in the country and also here in, in Michigan is, is, is a super uh, a movement that we have going on. We're blessed to work with uh, the prison system. You know, we got a strong warden here, other wardens in the MDLC that let us come into their uh, institutions to provide programs, uh, and we're developing more of those. Uh, without that, it would be very difficult to do what we do. But I guess what I want to leave with is that, uh, like Carrie said, 95%, 95 to 98 percent of indig individuals are coming out of prison. Uh, they're coming to our communities. They're coming to our uh, churches. Uh, so it's incumbent upon us to help them reintegrate back into society, and we do that by, by again, case management and mentoring uh, individuals. Um, the good thing, one of the good things that, that it is, is that if you folks decide to hire uh, men and women with criminal histories and other companies, is that you have the support of all these agencies behind you. Uh, you're not out there alone. Uh, you, if you have questions, uh, you can ask us some of those tough questions that you probably couldn't ask in, a, in, a, in an open setting, um, and we'll be happy to, to answer those tough questions for you. But what we want to, um, and I'll end with this, is that a lot of these men and women uh, have been punished. They've served their time, that, you know, they take accountability, responsibility for what they do, um, but we don't, as a society, we don't want to keep punishing them for what they did five years ago, ten years ago. Um, and it's also a, a cost savings. I mean, uh, the warden can tell you better than I, but it's an average about $34,000 a year to keep an inmate uh, in prison. Um, if we can help reduce that recidivism rate, uh, that's a cost savings to, uh, to our state where we can use that money for education, roads, other things, uh, victim impacts. Uh, so we can use that money, divert that money other places and, and still provide services to men and women that are coming out of prison. So I appreciate that you folks are here. Again, we do a lot of the retention part of it uh, with mentoring and case management and partnering because uh, it's, it's a good thing to do, like Carrie said, it's a hard issue, but we also hold people accountable. We, we, we just don't uh, uh, put them out there. We, we make sure that they're vetted as much as possible, and we stand by each person that we uh, send out for employment, and then you have a direct line to us uh, if you have any questions, support questions. Um, so that's it. Great, thanks a lot, Ben. But thanks for all the great work you're doing, Ben, and, and, and the, the whole support mechanism, as we found our experience, is, is um, you know, we can provide a job, but we have a business to run, and the, the housing needs and the, the outside of work um, accountability support, uh, whatever's available, um, what Ben offers and, and other community uh, collaboratives is, is so much a part of the success. Um, to this uh, returning citizen segment, but it's so much, uh, so so rewarding, and and it's uh, there's so many benefits. Uh, ben and Carrie just named a few, so thanks a ton. Uh, we'll we'll move on to uh, Daniel uh, Vandermolen. Seems like you've got the funnest job here. You've got eight different um, 
community collaboratives that you're working with, um, removing barriers and, and uh, in regards to employment services. So uh, can you spend a few minutes and tell us what's going on? Absolutely, yeah. Never a dull moment with eight organizations. <laughs> um, so yeah, my name is Daniel, and I actually work for Goodwill Industries of Greater Grand Rapids. Um, so the hat I wear there is that I manage our career center. Um, when people say, when you hear Goodwill, most people think our thrift retail stores, um, but the money from those stores goes towards funding workforce development programs. Um, so we have a career center there, which is open to the public, very similar to what Michigan Works does, um, a place for people to come in and just do applications, get a resume put together. So if you have individuals who are looking to get into um, a career, they can come in and get assistance there. Uh, but what I'm really here to talk about is the Employment Services Collaborative, um, which is a collaboration of eight different organizations um, with workforce development focuses, um, came together to provide services cohesively rather than in silos. Um, like Ben mentioned, there are a lot of great organizations in Kent County doing a lot of great work. Um, so the goal of our collaboration is to avoid that duplication. Um, again, making understanding that goodwill doesn't need to do everything in the community. We can be very good at one thing and partner with different organizations that do something else um, to provide holistic services for the participants that we're serving. Um, so we have this collaboration of eight different organizations. We have a uh, service guide in your little packet there in amazing color. We don't have a color printer at Goodwill right now, so this is, this is great. Um, <laughs> and it's a nice little cheat sheet, because a big, a big portion of my job is going out and talking about the collaboration, and I always forget at least one organization when I'm listing all eight, so I'm gonna use my cheat sheet here. Um, but we have Goodwill, um, and then UCOM, so United Church Outreach Ministry. Hispanic Center, Women's Resource Center, Literacy Center of West Michigan, Hope Network, Jubilee Jobs, um, and Disability Advocates um, complete the eight organization collaboration. Um, and again, each, each organization has some element of workforce development built into it, but you notice that not everybody does the same thing here. Um, so when we got together, we really pinpointed where there were holes in services and where we could help each other out. Um, so for example, uh, Hispanic Center. Uh, they can um, come and provide translation interpretation services. So we, we don't have a, we have less people than we probably like at Goodwill who actually are Spanish speaking, so we can utilize those services um, to be able to provide more cohesive um, services. We have the Literacy Center. Uh, if somebody comes through one of our doors and maybe has a low literacy level that's making it so they can't advance in their current uh, position or is stopping them from getting a, um, getting a career, then we can make that referral. Um, to the literacy center. So it's a lot of different organizations in finding that specific role within the collaboration that we can provide for each other. Um, the main crux of what we're doing is the idea of no wrong door into services. So you can come into Goodwill and then you get um, services from all eight organizations kind of inherently. Um, and reducing that duplication. So Goodwill used to have a GED program, but we're partnering with Jubilee Jobs and because of that, G, um, Jubilee Jobs has a, very, has a GED program. We can make that direct connection if it's appropriate. Um, a key thing is we're not only referring through these eight organizations, so if it's not geographically appropriate um, or if there's some other need that another organization outside of the collaborative provides, we'll make that referral to a different organization as well. Um, but having that relationship, Goodwill was able to step back from providing GED services knowing that Jubilee Jobs provides that service and is actually doing it on site at Goodwill now. Um, so reducing duplication and also working on shared intake documentation for participants who come through our doors. Um, what we hear, what we heard from a lot of people is one of the barriers towards using services in Kent County is that they'd go from organization to organization and have to fill out the exact same paperwork at each organization. Um, and it becomes a barrier in itself. So we have one intake document that we use and then can share with the other organizations within the collaborative. So somebody comes, um, to Hope Network, uh, they can, they'll do it there, and then they won't have to re, um, do it at Goodwill again. Um, so doing that, um, shared release forms and shared data systems, actually. We're working um, within our collaboration, but also on a county level to kind of help inform a shared data process. Um, so again, people can, won't have to fill that information more than once. We can enter it in at Goodwill, and then the other organizations have access to that. Um, so we're actually gonna be moving forward with that, hopefully within the next month or two, getting that system launched. Um, and then case conferencing. So each organization has what's called a lead navigator um, from their organization. So all eight organizations have one individual who's dedicated to providing the collaborative services. And every single week at one o'clock, all eight organizations get together and we case conference. So again, kind of focusing on that no wrong door idea, somebody could come to Goodwill and we might not have the right service to provide for them, we, go to, we get together every single Monday and talk about what might be the right spot for that participant to receive services. And we're working with um, 
all sorts of individuals and all sorts of different barriers. Um, we do have a theme. We, we do work with returning citizens. Hope Network um, and Goodwill both have programs for that. But it's really anybody who's unemployed, underemployed, or has some sort of barrier that's stopping them from getting to that position, which can help them get ahead. Um, so this really kind of runs the gamut of different types of um, individuals, but really focusing on barrier res uh, resolution. Um, our next steps, uh, we've been providing services for about, well, we've actually been actively providing services for a little over a year now. We're in the second year of our grant, um, but we're getting ready to go through the grant process, proposal process again um, through United Way, and we're really focusing on um, how can we help individuals get into employment, but then also help individuals get to that next level of employment. Um, so that might be you're working in your current field, but you need a certification to help get you to that next level, help get you that promotion. Um, what's that next step to really, um, Get, um, get away from just surviving into thriving. Um, and having a focus on that is what we're looking at over the next couple years. And we are already partnering with a lot of these great organizations up here, um, both Zealand and Butterball, um, we work with through the collaboration um, because we have Hope Network doing transitional work experiences for our participants. Um, I was talking to Randy right before, um, really focused on making sure people get to the right organization, again, either within our collaboration or at other organizations out in the community. Um, so really just focusing on that barrier resolution um, and what's stopping that individual from getting employment at that time, and then providing ongoing um, retention services throughout that process. Um, at right. Goodwill, we are focused on 365 days of retention. Right. Um, so that's an entire year where you're gonna have somebody, um, a career coach, a job coach, walking along with you and providing that retention service um, so that you can get to that year of um, successful year of employment. Uh, so really focusing on retention within the collaboration as well and having some Having that support system, which is again a lot of times a barrier for somebody not having that support system built Daniel, in. Daniel, thanks so much. Yeah. Really appreciate it. I mean, the, the collaborative approach is, uh, you know, with uh, reducing uh, duplication and making things easier for everyone, and and even you know relating to this meeting and other collaborative initiatives going on in our communities, it's uh, it's phenomenal. So, thanks so much for all the good work you're doing. We'd like to hear from uh, Randy Otterbridge, um, Director of Employment and Workforce Development at the Grand Rapids Urban League. Randy, can you spend a few minutes? And Absolutely. You, you know, I appreciate everybody coming out, and I had the pleasure of uh, eating at a new sushi restaurant last night, and it started calling me a few minutes ago. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I survived, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and when we start talking about survival, uh, and we have people coming into our organization, and some are in survival mode. Um, we have the pleasure over at the Grand Rapids Urban League to be an organization that has wraparound services. Um, we have our employment division, we have a housing division, we have an education division, and then we have our health and wellness division. And we've just added another pillar, which is our racial equity, uh, diversity, and inclusion division. So if we get an individual in, and at any level that they're having some difficulties, we have an opportunity to wrap those services around them right there at the Urban Link. But when our, uh, in our employment division, sometimes that can be uh, an opportunity for us to get extremely creative and you know, to talk with other organizations, to be a conduit for people to you know, connect with these job opportunities. But of course, you have to have the job opportunities out there. And that's why we appreciate having HBA and uh, some of the other organizations that are at this table to at least give us a chance to say to an individual, hey, we can call this person. You know, I can get in touch with Goodwill. I can call up someone and say, hey, look, we got an opportunity for you. Whether they have uh, some barriers in their backgrounds or whether they just are underemployed or whether they just might not know. You know, I'll give you an example. We had a young lady come in who had worked at her company for 29 years, had been let go, right? Now she's in shock. And one of the things, she just kind of walked into our organization and said, how can you help us? She had been making a significant amount of money at that level. And what we did was we were able to call up some, some, some organizations that we knew were hiring. They had some good pay levels and we were able to connect her with that opportunity. So we appreciate everybody that is our, that, that are providing opportunities. And I can say that, you know, when we get someone in that has a background, for example, and about 29.7% of the people that we see have some kind of background. Now, um, I was, uh, uh, pleased to hear Kerry say that uh, some people haven't been caught, right? But, uh, you know, still, um, it, it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to just, you know, reach across, um, you know, opportunities and tell people that we, we, can, we can get them connected. 
So some of the heavy lifting that we do for our individuals, we're pleased to do that. Uh, you know, our team over there, we work cooperatively, you know, amongst the silos, if you will. It seems like we can't seem to get away from that silo building, but at the same time, we can connect those silos wherever they are and say, hey, now you have an opportunity to walk across and get, um, you know, a possibility. I was talking with, uh, you know, people over there at the, the locational village a couple of months ago, and we were talking about how can we collaboratively get together and help some folks that are coming out. And we talk about, we are wrapping some services around them, not just getting a job, but because we have the housing division, now we can connect them with work or, or housing opportunities. And if there's you know, anything they're lacking in the educational field, we have that as a supportive services that also helps them. So we are pleased to be here, to be a conduit to, for, for you guys. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're a conduit for us. And like I say, I'm gonna do everything I can to keep this sushi down <laughs> today. But I just want to let you know, let you know that the Urban League is here to help anybody that needs help. You know, um, again, we got about 95% of the people that come in are African American, but we will help anybody that comes to those doors that say they need uh, some services. So I'm pleased awesome. to be here for that. Great, thanks a lot, Randy. Really appreciate you sharing um, everything except the sushi story. But um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Thanks so much for all the work you're doing. Um, next, we'd like to hear from uh, Stuart Ray, the executive director at uh, Guiding Light Ministries Back to Work program. So, Thank Stuart, you, if you could share for a few minutes with us. Thank Thanks. you, Mike. It's, it's great to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Guiding Light's a little ministry downtown that uh, we kind of focus on helping men uh, or community members get back to work. We have a program that we call Back to Work, where men actually are given uh, 90 days in safe residents, uh, given three squares, uh, they're required to save their money, they're all going to work, they're required to save their money, I've said that, so that they have some kind of exit strategy so they can find housing um, <clears throat> at the end of the day. We kind of take them from wherever they come in, we also run a recovery program, and I also think we run the best recovery program in Kent County, um, it's a residential program. But I'm really gonna go back to the theme of this, and it's thinking outside the box. Um, I spent 31 years in the for-profit side of uh, our community before I came to Guiding Light. And at some point in time, I decided I was going to hire an individual to help me with organizational development. <clears throat> and we went through the interviewing process. And at the end of the day, she turns to me and, and she goes, you know where the problem is? And of course, I'm thinking, well, it's downstream. <clears throat> she says, the problem's you. What? Do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> <clears throat> that we had just, you know, negotiated pay and all that good stuff. And I said, no, I'm hiring you to fix this thing. She says, I'm not doing anything. You're the problem. And I, as I normally do, if I think I have a, a potential, potential problem employee, I put them in the office across from me. So she sat in the office for six months. And she says, I'm not going into, and I was running restaurants. <clears throat> I'm not going into the restaurants until such time as you and I begin to address your problems. Well, um, she was right. So um, at the time, I, was, uh, I owned 30, probably 30, 35 restaurants. Uh, I had 2,200 employees. Um, I was the one who had to go through the change agent process. And I'm assuming I'm talking to those individuals in the room who um, probably have direct control over what's going on in the environment within your organizations. So at the end of the day, we took, um, so I'm running some Burger King restaurants, 2,200 employees. Um, we took turnover from 100%. Now keep in mind, turnover in fast food runs four to 500%. You probably have that same problem in your own industries. And we took it down to 50. But the change had to come here. Change does not come down there. So, and Mike, I'm gonna be um, respectfully disagree with you. The problem is the CEOs in the organizations. And <clears throat> our, pres our, our first presenter uh, made that comment that it needs to change at the top of the organization. If, if you're really going to get sustainable employment within your organizations, everyone's doing great work here, but this isn't the answer. These are kind of, uh, for me, these are kind of band-aids. We're doing great work but we're not gonna fix this problem. I wanna go someplace else. How am I doing on time? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> um, we can create all the jobs in the world, but if we don't create sustainable housing, people can't sustain their jobs. And I do think that's an employment business. 
And that's the employer's problem. Also, it's not our problem, it's a community problem. We all need to be involved in this particular issue. So if average rent today, and my peers probably know better than I, is 11 or 12 or 1,500 bucks a month, you can't be working a $10 an hour job. It's not, it's not gonna work. So what I have learned at Guiding Light, I also learned in my Burger King business, that I need to understand what's going on in my employee's mind or my client's mind. I've got to peel this onion back, and peel it back, and peel it back, and peel it back, and where are the barriers, and how do I help with the barriers? So we started the Back to Work program because guys coming into Heartside, believe it or not, it's not on their bucket list. It's the very last place they want to be. They want to be contributing members of society. But if you're coming out of the court system, and Carrie, you know better than I, um, there's, there's a number. They all have some legal debt that they owe back to the system, right? And it's a bunch. It's a lot of money. So if you've got court fines, <clears throat> and if you don't pay them, you're going back to jail. And they're, and they're tacking on more fines. So as the employer, you, I'm encouraging to understand that and understand what they're going through and the pressures they have around those particular issues. You're all familiar with front of the front of the court because you're you know you're handling those particular payroll issues inside your own organizations, but that's a huge barrier for individual sustaining employment. Um, so it's so the point I'm trying to make it's not just about the jobs; it's about all those other things that are going on. Really quick story: Next Step Ministries. I don't know if you know those folks. Scott Johnkoff runs a little little construction company taking returning citizens and guys coming out of recovery. <clears throat> it's got some city contracts, ICCF contracts. They bring a, a gentleman into me off the bridge, Wealthy Street Bridge, panhandling. Let's call him Bobby. Uh, they say to me, would you put him in your back to work program, give him three squares, shelter, make him save his money. We'll give him work. So I turn to Bobby. How much money are you making on the bridge every day? 150 bucks. I turn to the next step. What are you paying him? 840. Hmm. Hmm. Now, if I'm an entrepreneur, where am I going? I'm going back to the bridge. Um, he lasted about a week with us. Um, and of course, I asked Bobby, do you have plenty of food? Yes, I can eat. There's seven free meals in Heartside. I can get all the food I want, all the clothing he needs. Everyone has Obama phones today. So my only point is, is I think we need to take a out of the box, global view in regards to what's going on in our community, where is the housing, uh, what other issues are people dealing with, and begin to address those collectively. You are part of the solution also. Thank you. All right, thank you, Stuart, really appreciate it. And I, I do agree, it does have to start from the top, the, the, the uh, executive level, um, to, to buy into um, the commitment it takes and to, for the returning citizen community, and the, the collaborative uh, ideas that you shared. I mean, just really appreciate it. Next, uh, we'd like to hear, I'll probably uh, butcher this name, Tony. Uh, Tony Jalafi, is it? Jalifi. okay. Tony Jalifi is the uh, Strong Fathers Coordinator from the Grand Rapids African American Health Institute. Um, please share with us, Tony. Thanks Good morning, everyone. I'm kind of losing my voice a little bit, so if y'all could just bear with me just a little bit. <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you a little bit. In fact, Stuart kind of set me up. It's actually been fantastic. I think everybody down the row have said, everybody, did you arrange this purposely like this, Judy, where we set each other up? You did a great job of setting <laughs> yeah. up. Um, listen at the different uh, areas where everyone working so far, and we still have a few left. I thought about where do strong fathers fit into some of this? Um, just a little bit about the program. We work with men with children under the age of two. We try to get the fathers as early as possible. I, I tease sometimes and said, I want to be right there as soon as the baby is made. <laughs> I don't want to be the third party in there, but you know. <laughs> but that's how early we want the dads. That way we have the full two years to work with them. Uh, we don't provide any services, all right? We use different places like the Urban League and other places in the community to look for services. What we do is we sort of build men inside. Um, we are not a, um, a Christian organization. We are a nonprofit. So we have the, the it, not that they have, a, also, well, I'm gonna just, since we all up here playing, it's a barrier. Sometimes when you're dealing with people that are not Christian, so sometimes they don't want to go to Christian organizations and look for help. 
All right. So um, we don't use that as a barrier for them. So the men that come into our program, they feel free. Um, and what we do is that we do home visits, which is probably one of the most important things. A lot of the men in our program never had a dad. Um, majority of the young men in our program, dads who are in prison, are some of these returning men that we are looking at and we're talking about. So they do not have some of the skills it takes to understand that, you know, um, when you're a father, you have to put your children before you put yourself. Trust me, I have that conversation over and over and over in my head with my children and myself when I think about, do you know how much you cost me? <laughs> <laughs> Please understand, you are a Corvette, you are a bigger house, and, <laughs> you know, and, and when you become a dad, you realize that. But a lot of the men we service, haven't put that in their minds because for the whole, the whole of their life, they've been struggling, right? And now once you become a dad, it kind of push you back a little bit further. To give you a realistic idea of it, um, we work with primor primarily African-American men, but just like most organizations, we allow anyone that wants to be a part of the program come in. So when we're dealing with a dad, especially looking at work and getting into um, um, home building and things of that nature and skilled trade, um, a lot of our dads are sitting way back there in that corner chair when other dads are sitting right here at start. So what we try to do is close that gap internally with them and help them understand a lot of realities of life. Like one, you will have to probably work 10 times harder to get up to that level right there. And you're gonna have to do that unless you really, really uh, run down to Lansing with me and change some laws. Um, but most of them rather do that work. And I liken that too. I remember um, as a kid, I used, to, I used to be one of the fastest runners with me and two cousins. And my brother would like to see us race. And I was the fastest, so he always made me start three squares behind them. You know, as a competitor, and me and are, that's who we are, we are competitors. And I found out women like to compete too, right? Um, it was fun at first because, you know, I had to I looked at it as a challenge to, to meet them at the same finish line. You know what I mean? But it was exhausting, though. Did that make sense? It was exhausting that I had to start two, three squares behind them to catch up with them. And by the time I caught up with them, if it was another race, guess who was going to be further behind? Me, because I already had to run that much harder. So I try to prepare them to help them understand that you're going to have to run that race. And once you have children, you can't quit, right? So. We build them from the inside with our home visits. We help them work on some of those soft skills, some of those skills that um, they were never taught. Um, we talk about home building. Majority of the men that I service in my community have no, uh, you know, some of the guys I, I work with, I was not in my program, but as friends, um, they do, you go into their garages, they have two, you know, you know, garage full of tools. They have all type of different things. A lot of the guys I service, if you hand them a circular saw, they think it's gonna kill them. If you put it, I'm just being serious. It's like dealing with children almost. If you really want to service these men, you're going to have to invest in them on the inside and understand um, it's not just housing, which is extremely important because, we, again, we're dealing with a, a population of people, of, of men that never, ever lived in their own house before. They went from their mom's house to baby mama's house. Do that make sense? Mm -hmm. So they, and how, do, how do you feel when you walk into the house that you pay for every day? even though it could be taxing, right? But you, that's your home, right? So now you're looking at a population of men that can't even get to a home as Stu has uh, described, right? So you've already taken away that competitor and you're chipping them down with little things like that. So you know you got to invest a little bit more into who he is inside, you know what I mean? And, and not hold barriers of what kind of religion he come from, um, where do he live and different things of that nature. So we spend a lot of time building that person up on the inside, helping them. Um, we, we more look like it as a mentorship type program, um, but we do help them with diapers. Um, I do different things like I order Legos, right? So when, when dad gets a crate of Legos, he has something to do with his kid. He can sit there and he can build something. You know what I mean? We do different things like that. We look, we think sort of outside the box. I've made sure, in fact, I just got a shipment last week of um, $20 two boxes that I'm gonna give to each one of the dads in our program. We have uh, 87 men in our program because most of them never owned a wrench. Are you kidding me? And you want to hire them? <laughs> that was mm -hmm. a joke. <laughs> but, but you got to have someone, you got to understand this is what you're starting with, okay? And be patient with them. I wrote down something 
um, that this uh, young lady here said is that students need more care and patience. Well, when you're looking at a population of people that never had care and no one ever showed them any patience, you're pretty much starting with scratch with this person on the inside. So you gotta have, you have to have something a little extra to give him, you know, give him more. Uh, we get to work with him until the children turn two, but after two, it's a drop off, right? You know, it should be a stop gap in there where we, someone can work with him from age two until five years old. Help building up that confidence. It takes confidence to be a dad. It really does, it takes it. It's the difference between a father and a man in there. A man, you can take your, over, you can fly up, take off and do what you wanna do. But when you're a dad, you gotta have some stability to the ground, right? So we try to help create some of that foundation, but we also would like to look at different ways to expand and um, fill up those gaps and also strengthen those men so they can understand that, you know, being a dad is a whole nother level of life. Awesome. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks a lot, Tony. Thanks for your passion on uh, building into young men and, and uh, outside of the comment on being there when the baby was uh, made. Um, <laughs> really appreciate your comments. <laughs> um, next, we'd, we'd like to hear from John Van Elst. Uh, John is the program manager at the uh, Grand Rapids Community College MTech Center um, in charge of the residential job training programs and construction work workforce development alliance classes. So, John, what can you tell us? Well, I'm good. I get to follow up two powerful testimonies, right? And a bad sushi story, so. <laughs> um, my friend Randy over there. Wow, uh, GRCC, um, for many years, as you guys know, we provide one thing in particular, and those are credentials, right? You think about GRCC, you think either about an associate degree, a certificate, whatever, how long that takes you. So when you look at employment, you know, the employers, you guys, you want those credentials. And so for the last 15 years, a lot of the work that I do with my coworkers is career pathway development. And so we learned a lot in the last 15 years, particularly in the last seven years. And when you think outside of the box and, you know, connect outside of the box, about seven years ago, that's when we decided we can't do that everything. GRCC is not the one stop for career pathways. So we decided to be very intentional and reach out to certain organizations and partner with them. Everything you heard, I just want to stand up and say amen, you know, about being a father and, and about how to, everything starts at the top. And, and then collaboration. Everything you heard today, we worked really hard in this area, especially at the community organization level, and GRCC and Talent 2025 and a lot of others, HBA, ABC, to be collaborative. But saying that, did we really go out and reach into the community? Who heard, you know, who read about three years ago an article from Forbes magazine? Anyone familiar with that article? I'm gonna tell you. Hopefully whenever, it's usually when I say Forbes, people know what I'm talking about. Grand Rapids, or Grand Rapids, the city of Grand Rapids and the surrounding area usually gets voted one of the best places to live, right? Usually typically we're best to raise a family, which is very true, right? But Forbes Magazine three years ago said that's very true, but we're second to last in one area. And what do you guys think that is? The advancement of colored people in the career pathways. To, to get a house, to be a strong father, to, to have the opportunity to be just as successful in Grand Rapids area. So why, why did I bring that up? It's GRCC had the privilege of getting um, a little foundation money from the Kellogg Foundation to really be intentional around career pathways, to work in our neighborhoods in Grand Rapids, they're not seeing the same success as a lot of us. To do that work, we knew that we couldn't go in alone. So what we usually do sometimes in higher ed is we develop programs, we create classes, and people will come, right? That's, that, that was our, our thinking, people will come if we develop it. But we found out sometimes people don't come because we really didn't stop and listen to what they're looking for, especially in the workforce area. Are they already working? Can they come to daytime classes? Can, you know, maybe they're working the typical seven to three or eight to four and they can't come to our classes during the day. So we relied on our partners in the area, especially, you know, there's a lot of them in this room. Um, real quick, a story about one of our new partnerships was with the Hispanic Center, the Literacy Center of West Michigan. And the need was around machine CNC. I know we're here in construction, and we can do this career pathway development with any sector. Uh, but this one was around machine CNC. We did a contextualized ESL class that was just around CNC. 
And so everyone that was coming into this class was learning English, was strengthening their English skills, provided through the Literacy Center, but also it was around a job that's going to give them at least a good starting entry level wage. Um, a lot of times we don't, you know, you heard the $10 stories, you heard I'm going to go back on the bridge. Our credentials usually in work for, work, uh, force development can provide a good starting wage. So we went and we, the Hispanic Center went out, always had, they already had the trust in the community with the people that wanted the good jobs. They were already working already, but they needed to make a better wage so they had to work one, two, three jobs. So that's, that's just the story of what we do at GRCC, Tassel Impact. We listen to our partners, we go into the community, we're very intentionally, because people that are coming through our doors right now are living in those neighborhoods that are not seeing the same success as many of us. So I'm excited to be here. Uh, we work hard with the Essential Needs Task Force. Uh, we also work with Talent 2025. We work with all these groups to be collaborative, but to really to start at that top level and get to those hiring managers too, right? Because those supervisors, we know if the change doesn't happen at the top, especially with the supervisor, um, some of the people that we're training, we can train all day, but they're not getting the opportunity to get that job. Yep, great. Thanks so much, John, for, sh for sharing. Um, next, we'd yeah. like to hear from uh, Warden Burton. Warden is the, uh, with the Vocational Village at the Michigan Department of Corrections, uh, Richard A. Handlin Correction Facility. So thanks for joining us, and uh, please share with us uh, the exciting story at uh, the Vocational okay. Village. We are like the Red Roof Inn. We always have the lights on. Um, anyone wants to come through for a visit, um, I, I typically do probably about 98% of the tours. That's something that I'm committed to doing. I actually did a tour last night at 9 o'clock at night. Um, so we're, that is something that, as you saw the governor in the video, um, we have the commitment from the governor down to uh, our director of the Michigan Department of Corrections. Uh, one of the things that I, I would like for uh, all the employers to take away is, I mean, this is something that I'm asking employers to kind of help us finish building this airplane out. We actually started building this plane while we were in mid-flight. And what I mean by that is as I get uh, employers come in, they take a tour and say, you know, um, you ever thought about doing this? And I, I got employers that are actually donating uh, machinery and materials because I, what I envision is is employers should be able to call me and say hey um, I need three guys for second shift um, at that point my employment counselor Mr. Fultz here um, we have resumes that we do on all the gentlemen as soon as they come in and at that point we can actually send the resumes over to the employers at that point, you can look at the resume, you can look at the skill set, you can come in, you can actually interview them. You can interview them by video, you can interview them by phone. Um, yesterday was a, a great thing as far as in the prison setting. I had an employer come in yesterday, their HR department, and they hired three of our, three of our guys that are still incarcerated before they get out. Um, last month, I, I had one leave out of automotive and he had two job offers before he even left the prison. He had to pick which employer he wanted to work for. So that's one of the things that we're doing. But in terms of, of helping people retain these guys, um, what I'm asking employers to do is just treat them the same. Treat them the same as you would any other employee you have. But the thing is, is part of their condition of parole is they have to have a positive work history. If they don't, they come back. And that's why what we're doing, we, we've typically ran in silos, what happened in the prison, then when we sent them out of the prison and they went out into the field in the community, well now they're, we're tying the two together. Um, I'm averaging about 50 parole agents a week coming in for specialized training on what we're doing. And what we're asking the employers to do, if they're late getting to work, if there's something going on, report it to the parole agent. And from there we can, we can take care of it before it spirals out of control. Um, anybody want any questions they would like to see me afterwards? I'll be available. Thank you. Thanks a ton, Ward. That's awesome. Um, major development and um, appreciate all that good work there. Um, next, we'd like to hear from uh, Sari, Sarah Sherry Knuster um, from Mick Staffing. Um, what's going on in your world? Um, well, I am Sarah 
Sherry Knuster. That's right. <laughs> I just got married, so now my last name is Knuster. Um, and I am the owner of Mixed Staffing and Recruiting, and I started Mixed Staffing in 2012, and I had a desire to help educated women and minorities uh, get into the workplace. Um, now fast forward four years. Um, we started in 2012 with one employee. We have uh, about 300 plus employees. Um, and then internally, we just hired our seventh internal recruiter. And so we're continuing to expand and grow and, and hopefully get our mission out there. Um, we have three divisions. We have a professional staffing and recruiting division. We have a diversity staffing and recruiting division. And then we have an inclusive workforce staffing division where we work with individuals who are returning citizens and military veterans. Um, and our goal is not to just say, hey, we, we employ them, but we essentially walk alongside them. So um, if we can't find them a job, we try to do the best to kind of coach and counsel them to say like, hey, maybe this is why you're not getting the job. Um, maybe it's whether it is that they come into the interview with a phone in their hand or their pants sagged or they, um, just their social skills might not be there. So we just try to walk alongside them to kind of help them and say, hey, maybe come back in a week and we can have you work on interviewing skills with some of our recruiters. Um, just kind of a backstory of how that division got started because I guess it, it's different. That's kind of what differentiates us from our competition. Um, but in 2013, I had a friend of mine ask if I would hire one of his friends um, who was a felon, a felon or a yeah, he had a felony. And that was kind of how I used to see it. Um, I would say, oh, um, you know, I'm sorry, but we just really don't work with that demographic. Um, I started to pray about it, and I just said, gosh, who am I to judge somebody that I don't know? And I was like, okay, well, what I'm going to do is I put together a three-week program um, where I went into the Kent County Jail and taught individuals who are soon to be released um, just how to be employable and employability skills. And my whole life, I used to have this big fear of somebody who had a felony. And I learned very, very quickly within 15 minutes how genuine, how caring, how good of people really were in jail who just maybe didn't have the same opportunities that I did. Um, so I started trying to put myself in their shoes. I did a lot of research. I tried to figure out how can I help this group of people um, who are oftentimes looked past. and. Um, I decided to take the top five guys out of this 20 group workshop that we did and find them jobs, and I did that. And I would say out of the five, three should, are still employed today. Um, there's always going to be human error, but um, we've had really good success with that. So then we started kind of doing that every month um, and then looking at other resources of how to bring in talent that are people who are just being missed or looked aside. Um, I think a lot of times someone might check a box that they have a felony and they're just not seen um, or considered and then you don't get to hear their story of why they are, where they are, um, and who they are just as a person and where they want to go. Um, so essentially we work with several different industries. We, um, construction is one of them. We work with Eastbrook Homes and we actually work with Zealand Lumber. Um, and we do anything from professional placements, so executive positions, down to general labor um, positions, and, and we really try to strive um, to work with companies whose mission and values align with ours. Um, another story is a guy named Will. He came into our office and he had served a life sentence. Um, I think he was 40, he was 46 or 48, and um, there was just something different about him. He seemed genuine, but his uh, communication skills were not the best. He was really kind of reserved. Um, he had a hard time filling out an application. There was just things that I was just kind of like, gosh, there's something, something's different about him. Um, and this was before we even knew what his background was or that he had served a life sentence. And then we get to hear his story and he grew up, um, gosh, I think it was Muskegon. And he was in, you know, he had parents that were drug addicts. He um, was in gangs. It was a gang shootout. Um, he. Uh, felt terrible, he shot someone and he had, the person had died, so he gets sentenced to a life sentence and he went in at 17, came out, I think he said it was 25 or 30 years later, and he just never had a job. And 
Um, he's actually still employed to this day um, at the company. He worked through us for 90 days. They hired him in right away. He got a promotion, um, and he's still there. So those are like the reasons why we continue to do what we do um, in, in hope to partner with organizations like 32.2, and um, I'm wanting to make sure we connect with you <laughs> to, to get into the prison. Um, but just giving people a chance who are otherwise not, <laughs> <laughs> not uh, seen as, um, as, as important. And um, one thing we have found is the loyalty um, the people who take advantage of continuous education and um, just the difference of how we can connect with people outside of the stereotypical um, box. So thanks right. for having us here. Hey, thanks a lot, Sarah. And that is exactly what we um, like to see happen as this is kind of the first handshake to future connections and future relationships. So that, uh, I don't know if everyone saw it, but the business card passing there was uh, just a, a great, great thing. So um, next, we'd love to hear about the uh, uh, Michigan uh, Veterans Affairs Agency from Alan Nash, the uh, um, Employment Services uh, Manager. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us here today. And I think since I'm the last one, I can use the remainder of the time. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, as you said, I'm Alan Nash. I'm the manager of the Veterans Employment Services for the Talent Investment Agency. Um, my team is uh, responsible for the administration of the Jobs for Veterans State Grant. Uh, the origin of our grant goes back to the early 1940s. We were the employment component to the 1944 Servicemen's Readjustment Act that brought us the Montgomery GI Bill. Uh, then in 1980, Congress expanded the program to include the Disabled Veteran Outreach Program Specialist. This was in response to the returning Vietnam veterans that were having issues transitioning back into the workforce and into their local communities. And the programs uh, evolved ever since. Today, in Michigan, we have a dedicated team of disabled veteran outreach program specialists, along with local veterans employment representatives that are integrated into the local Michigan Works Agency system to work with that 30% of our veteran population that is experiencing uh, significant barriers to employment. Uh, such as homelessness, incarceration, long-term unemployment, uh, service-connected disabilities and disabilities, through to some of our um, first-term transitioning veterans that are just need a, just need a little bit of support um, um, transitioning into their local communities. Um, last year, I think our team, you know, we've worked with over 1,500 veterans. Um, and our, our passion and our, our probably the number one asset that we have is time. Uh, our case managers take the time to get to know the clients. Uh, we'll put together you know, a comprehensive assessment, uh, an employment plan, and then we'll work with partners um, along with the, the state agency on helping place them into the community, into career positions. And ultimately, um, that is our goal. Um, our program's easy to access. Uh, if you're a veteran, it's as simple as walking into a Michigan Works one-stop center, um, you know, declaring that you are a veteran, and then you would receive all of the career services afforded to you under what we call priority of service. If you're an employer, I have three suggestions. One, um, reach out to the Michigan Works business services team. They have access to right now roughly the 22,000 veterans who are actively seeking work within the Talent Connect system. Uh, they also have direct access to our program, um, our case managers, uh, along with our veteran uh, clientele. I would also recommend um, looking into our partner agency, which is the Michigan Veterans Affairs. They have what's called the, the veteran, veteran Friendly Employer Program. This is, we're going on our fourth year, and it has evolved into basically a private sector-led coalition um, that focuses on, you know, attracting and retaining veteran talent within the community. Uh, we're, we just hit the 60 employer mark um, with companies such as General Motors, Roush Industries, Quicken Loans, um, all the way down through to midsize and, and smaller companies. So this is Best practices that's happening happening in the veterans community 
centered on retention because that's the, that's the direction. That's what we've seen has been the most successful for employers is to focus on retention more than going out and, and looking or seeking, um, seeking veteran clients. So that attracting and retention piece is, is important. Um, last, I'd like to kind of build on kind of what uh, Dawn was talking about. Uh, within the Talent Investment Agency, it is all about skilled trades. Uh, that's been our focus for the last, last couple of years. Um, but there's been a kind of a renewed emphasis. And here within the next week or so, I believe there's going to be a kind of a formal announcement on the Going Pro program. So it's within the Talent Investment Agency. We're going to kind of align some of our the successful programs that we've had to date, such as the Skilled Trades Training Fund, um, Matt Squared, Community Ventures, and we're going to align it along with uh, our apprenticeship programs. Uh, we received a new grant, which is going to kind of expand uh, some of the apprenticeship opportunities and some of the throughout the throughout the state. So that information should come out probably within the, in the next week or so. So there's a lot happening right now uh, within the veterans community. And, you know, if you're looking for qualified veteran talent, um, you know, just stop in and see us or visit us on our, our website, the Michigan.gov TIA, Talent Investment Agency, and that will make, give you the first start and the links to all of our programs and all of our um, all of the people within our community that's uh, doing work for the veteran community. So, awesome. thank you. Great, thanks, Alan. Really appreciate it. I know we're so, all so passionate about what we do to kind of sum it up in a in a five minute introduction oh. is uh, is a challenge. But uh, thanks to everyone on the panel for doing that. And uh, Andy, now we have roughly 15, looks like 13 maybe minutes now for uh, for questions. So, is there are there any questions that we have uh, coming from the audience? Okay, go ahead, Andy. Because we've been sitting in, first of all, again, I want to thank, you know, the new Mike probably, that should be official. Um, thank you again to everybody. I know one of the things that we've talked a lot about in our, our Next Gen Committee, which is more than now, more beyond Next Gen to just everybody, Workforce Development Committee, are some of the stigmas or uh, myths that you find that maybe what we're trying to do is someone who might be willing to take a chance on someone but they have certain kinds of misconceptions that might prevent them from even taking that chance. I guess I would open that up to anybody on the panel and say, what are some of the things that you hear that you guys can help address knowing that uh, helping our members and the community take a chance on these folks? Yeah. Um, I think that the initial stigma is that, you know, once you've committed a crime, you're always a criminal, which is not always the case. Um, I have one story of a gentleman who, who went to prison for selling drugs, and the only reason he was selling drugs is to pay for his mom's chemotherapy. So it's not always malicious, detrimental, you know, crimes where you're murdering someone or you're raping someone. And when you say felony, that's initially where everybody's mind goes, but there are so many things. So I would say the first thing is to really understand if you're pulling a background check, what's on the background check and what it actually means. Um, 32.2 has a list of kind of best practices and it's a booklet, so I would be happy to email you a link um, to that booklet that kind of debunks a lot of those myths, um, but as, as well as gives you some best practices in terms of, uh, for instance, one statistic is that, you know, somebody that comes out of, of jail or prison and has not committed another crime in the, in the five years they've been out is no more of a risk to society or anyone else than somebody that's never done anything. It basically wipes the slate clean. So that is one of the biggest things that we, we encounter. And then there's the liability question. Everybody says, oh, if I hire somebody, then there's, you know, I'm gonna get in trouble if they do something. I, a couple things to that. None of our organizations that we work with has had any incidents in the last two plus years, all the way up to the 20 years we've been doing this, of a, a crime being committed on their property by a returning citizen and putting them at any risk. The state of Michigan offers bonding. If you do are concerned about that, they offer $25,000 of free bonding to organizations to cover 
theft or any of those kind of option kinds of things that you think may happen um, and that is free and then there's also a laundry list of liability information that's out there about what you what you can and can't do for instance people say i can't hire a felon because we do work in the healthcare industry that's not true um, it depends on the felony it depends on what that person has done it depends on what industry they're they're going into so we have all of that information as 322 we are a private sector initiative so we don't get any grant funding to put this together it's just there for you guys to access so you're welcome to to email me or grab my business card and I can send all of that information to you. Those are just a couple. Tony and then uh, Warren. Real quick, um, I, I can manage this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of people don't believe, once they believe that um, once the father start working and child support catch up with him, he don't want to work. That's a myth, he do want to work. But it's very difficult to go to work every week uh, for $100 and you can't even get back the next time to get get another check and I just want to hear something that no one knows so I would just want to help some people out here majority of times if a dad owes six hundred dollars a month in child support and a mom is receiving aid uh, section eight and different things of that nature out of that six hundred dollars mom is only getting a hundred dollars of it the other five is going back to pay it back to state and Medicaid so that's very hard to swallow when you live in a house and you know that money is still not even being returned to your home because of the other benefits that mom is receiving. So again, running that race, you're tired. You know, you're already starting out the gates late, right? And then when you constantly get these barriers in front of you, it makes you tired. It makes you, it drains you. It's not laziness, it's not that. It's just you're tired at some times. And until we close those gaps, some of these myths will still be there. So I just want y'all to know that, um, especially people in HR, you say, wow, he's paying a lot of money in child support. But if DHHS and friend of the court don't connect and communicate and say, hey, you know, um, he's paying majority of this money back to the state of Michigan and Medicaid, and I, I, rightfully so, somebody should pay back something, right? Because nobody lives for free. Um, but at the same time, is it fair enough for him to be able to walk in that house, hit that light switch, turn on the television for all the things that he paid for himself. Um, can we go to Ward first and then Stuart? Great. No, I was just gonna follow up on what uh, Carrie was saying. Uh, one of the other things that, that we also have for our returning citizens is actually certified through the state of Michigan and it's called a uh, certificate of employability. And what that does is in order for these prisoners to even qualify for it, they have had to have uh, some great behavior in prison, um, their work keys, they have to score silver or higher in those tests. But basically what it does is when this person comes out with this certificate of employability, it actually uh, releases you from uh, any liability. If they go out, this is outside the bond, the bond is so you can recover. But really, this uh, certificate of employability, as an employer, it, it releases you from any liability that happens with that person. This is uh, a program that we're really just starting to push, and I'm going to start making sure that the employers know about it. Good. Thanks, Warren. Go ahead, Stuart. <clears throat> Excuse me. This will be quick. Every employee we hire is a crapshoot, right? Every one of us sitting in the room is a crapshoot. It's the... <laughs> <laughs> And, and the problem is, even coming out of the mission, it's stamped on their forehead. And then the HR folks go, I told you we shouldn't have done that. Every one of us is a crapshoot. So point two, every employee, and I think my peers will agree with me on this, hires in to stay the rest of their lives. And it's usually the employer who disappoints the employee. Most of us come to work to stay. And, and just just to add to that, um, you know, the there is uh, the bonding and the and, and the, the liability issue. The fact is, to Carrie's point, it's it's a non-issue. And if you get your belief beyond that, this is this is even an issue. And we've recently done a little bit of tracking. The turnover rate has been better in our reentry segment, and the incidences have been less. Um, it's just a non-issue. So, any other questions? Go ahead. 
So on the panel here, how many of you deal with returning citizens just by a raise of hand as their primary service? Okay, so pretty much everybody. <laughs> yep, students for yourself. Um, my question is, my business is a service business where we work with the general public in their own home. So my barrier for me as a business owner is hiring guys knowing that they have a criminal background and we're in people's homes and that's something that people really protect and cherish. So my question is kind of twofold. You know, how do I, if this is something that I would entertain as an employer, how do I assure my clientele that having a criminal in their home is not gonna result in all their jewelry missing and or what are the legal ramifications because I do background checks now, what is my, what is my liability for claiming to do background checks knowing that I might have somebody that is a returning citizen it, it, does that pose any type of legal ramifications for me? Putting those individuals in people's residence. Does that make sense? Some of the employers here, I gather, own businesses where these returning citizens are going to a place of employment, you know, a factory or a production plant like Butterball. They're controlling that environment. I, I can't control the environment that my business functions in, which is in individuals' homes. Well, I can tell you one of the first things that um, I ask an employer is to tell me what your knockouts are. I mean, you know, give me the list of things that a person can't come with. And then we do some of that vetting right there at the Urban League. You know, so, you know, if a person comes in, they have a CSC, that's a heavy one, right? But then are there areas within that? You know, what is that CSC? What did it involve exactly? You know, so by asking up front, what are some of the barriers, what are some of the knockouts that you absolutely cannot have, then we have the opportunity to go and, you know, uh, find someone that doesn't have that particular issue and put you in front of a candidate that may have a background, but not the ones that you consider knockouts. So that's some of the stuff that we'll do. So our process has been, um, we, we start in a production structured setting but we've had many cases of, uh, which is kind of out of the public interaction space, but then we've had many cases of um, trust and, and good behavior and good performance and then promotion into, the, then it becomes into office, um, more role responsibility and, um, and more interaction with the public. So that's been our process and it's worked. Um, I think Carrie? I have one question here. I want to oh. first, uh, before I hand the mic over to him, a couple of weeks ago, I was, uh, attended the uh, uh, housing summit hosted by the chamber and city of Grand Rapids, and I had good fortune of meeting Jordan Eatman, Eatman right, from the uh, city of Grand Rapids Housing Commission, who's in, who I'm happy has joined us today. I think you had a question too, Jordan? I did. Okay. Uh, yes, my name is Jordan. I work for the city of Grand Rapids. Yes, okay. It's for the city of Grand Rapids, um, out of the executive office for housing. So that's been a barrier that I heard a lot of you say is a problem. And so I guess my question for each and every one of you that I would like for you to answer is what are you guys doing to address the housing concern that you guys have listed as, as a barrier for you and your employees? Or, or your returning citizens, I should say. Go ahead, Stuart. Well, it could be in general too, maybe, or yeah, just housing in general. So, so 322 is is a private sector initiative to track um, those returning citizens in the business sector. That being said, Butterball Farms is part of the source. So many of you may be familiar with the source, others may not, but it's a membership organization which reduces barriers for our employees. Um, probably, if I had to guess, about half of our, our employers as part of 32.2 are also part of the source, and they help reduce barriers for free um, for people on DHHS and people without to housing, they have connections to ICCF, they have connections to a plethora of housing initiatives, um, and they help those individuals whether they have a background or not. So that's kind of what Butterball Farms does. 32.2 is more of a data collection initiative, so we don't specifically address housing. 
but we have resources that if an employer came to us and said, we really like John, John's a great employee, he's having trouble finding housing, I can call Ben or I can call anybody on this right. panel or our other organizations and help uh, facilitate that. Stuart? Uh, we own, um, <clears throat> Guiding Light owns three fourplexes and we rent rooms below market. Um, probably more consistent with where their wage is, and which allows them to save and take care of some of their other financial uh, obligations. And then recently we've been signing master leases with landlords so that uh, our clients are actually leasing back from us. So <clears throat> um, and we've guaranteed the landlord uh, their payments and uh, allow our clients to continue to build their credit and uh, savings opportunities. Good, Warren. Also, uh, in corrections, we have uh, our reentry side, and I mean, we have money set aside uh, just for those uh, uh, issues that we're talking about now. Um, I know one of the examples is about maybe six weeks ago, I had a gentleman that uh, paroled out of my automotive section, and they set up his housing in his sentencing county. Well, his job was in another county. So we had to use our reentry money to actually cover his rent for six months. And we got him a place that was in walking distance from where the actual job was, to give him a better chance to be, to be more successful that way. And also, uh, to go back to your question, I didn't get a chance to, to intervene. Um, I'd like to talk to you. I, was, I just had a meeting yesterday with the uh, 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 labor union people out of uh, Detroit area. And I know for a fact that um, I could probably get you some data and make some connections for you, but um, they are taking returning citizens like in the uh, residential electrical apprenticeship program. And I mean, they're, they're sending these guys out um, working in houses and they're not having any issues. Um, but some of the things that I would probably think would be, as Randy called, a knockout is maybe previous substance abuse, but typically a, you know, something like a, uh, um, a second degree murder or something like that, those guys typically don't reoffend. I mean, the person that I think you would probably want to take a hard look at as maybe not is going to be that person that has had a continual substance abuse program, you know, problems. You know, the guy that I got in for uh, drinking and driving, I don't think he's going to be the guy that's going to be stealing on the job. I mean, his problem is outside of work, it's, it's the drinking. So, I mean, I, I would like to maybe work with you, get your information. And like I said, I just had, I had the electrical guys down, I had the uh, uh, iron workers down, and I'm gonna be going down to Detroit to meet with them to uh, figure out, because one of the things I'm working on is I'm trying to get it set up where we'll proctor the exams for their entrance into the union over in the Detroit area. So literally while they're in prison, they'll be able to take their test and know that they're accepted into the union over there. And like I said, they're, 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 they're taking them um, I know every other week they have a skilled trade and it's televised by the president of city council in Detroit. All these labor guys are coming up to the mic saying, that, you know, felony or not, I can put you to work tomorrow. We got all this work going on and they're not having issues and some of this stuff is residential. So why don't we talk afterwards and uh, my employment counselor and see what we can, we can do to help further answer your question. Awesome. Thanks. I think we had a question from the back. Yeah, sorry, my name is Amanda. Um, you had mentioned um, previously talking about dealing with like child support and things like that. And I know at least for myself, I'm a very small business, um, which means I wear a lot of different caps. It would be wonderful to have an HR department that could wade through all of that paperwork and all of that stuff. But as having being, been a person that's dealt with it once before, I mean, all of a sudden like I'm getting letters like left and right, like I don't know if they, you know, print tons and tons of mail and send it to me, but it got really, really difficult because I mean, I'm wearing so many different caps. Is there resources or help for us as the employer? Because obviously 
I want to make sure that I'm doing everything legitimate and everything right, but I don't have an HR department that's professional at it to be able to turn those types of paperwork over to, to make sure that we're complying properly on our end. And you ask the employee, and they have no idea what's going on. And so you're just kind of wading through this paperwork. And it gets really overbearing, especially when you are a small business, to make sure we're following exactly the ladder of the law, but also to make sure that it's done. And, and I, I will tell you that employee was an excellent employee, so it was worth going through that process. But it was an extremely difficult process, a very time-consuming process. And I, I felt like I was on the phone with them and, you know, waiting for hours to try to get an answer. And my resources could have been much better used to grow my business in a different area, which does make me skittish to wanting to deal with that again. Go ahead, Sarah. So I'm actually a small business, and I probably face that challenge every single day. And um, I think the biggest thing that I do is I look at, if I were them, I worked 80 hours of regular time and 30 hours of overtime. And if my child support bi biweekly payments are $600, I, I'm going to have a check for $400. So there's only so much relief that you can do as the employer. Um, what I do is I look at what the charges are. If there's arrears and fees, their caseworker can um, lower those without having to go to court and in front of a judge and things like that. Um, if there's any, they've got like the late fees that are past 12 weeks or um, there's, there's different, there's different like fines that they might have. If there's fines, they can get those lowered, but, um, there's not a whole lot you can do other than educate the employee that those can get lowered by them just making a call and asking to talk to their caseworker. Um, and then otherwise they, they do have to kind of, they have to go to court to get it lowered. They have to go in front of a judge and, um, what needs to happen is they need to have their their hourly wage get calculated because at some point what they're going to take is their highest um, pay at whatever time it was and that's how they're determining what their weekly and bi-weekly payments are. So I, I don't think, I don't know that I've found a very good answer to your question. Right. Thanks, Sarah. Tony? I, I guess I have one question before I can answer your question. What kind of paperwork are we talking about that you're receiving? Like when they're making like payment changes um, and stuff like that, like when you're getting the initial paperwork and what happens if like the check is not enough because maybe they were sick for one week or you're dealing with all of that and then you get a phone call or you get a letter and you get all of this paperwork and you know and, and you're trying to make it work but like I don't have the time I don't have the energy or resource to be able to put into that when I've got all this other stuff that I have to do. Right uh, and you know what and I applaud you. I'm gonna tell you right now thank you. You know, um, a lot of times when you get, do get inundated with all that paperwork, it takes, it can be cumbersome, right? And if you had a larger staff, is what you're saying, that you can manage it. But I'm going to tell you right now, thank you, because that's a dad that needs his job, especially if he has a large family. Now, unfortunately, unless Dan Foytek, which is the director of Friend of the Court, um, was sitting here, <clears throat> he can probably best answer that question for, you, for himself. But if you make sure I have your information before I leave, I meet with him regularly, and um, I'll be more than happy to... Uh, maybe invite you, because I'm telling you, um, at FOC, they need to hear from employers. They do not hear from employers. I promise you. And they're not invited to the table here. Dan is a fantastic guy. He, he hasn't been in um, position for a whole year yet, but he's really a good-hearted person, to be honest. But he's still bound by the laws, which they have to follow, which is sent down from the state of Michigan. OK, so um, but he still need to hear from employers, though. He hear from the other side, employees all the time. In fact, um, just recently, if you don't mind, um, <clears throat> the Kent County just recently hired two sheriffs to go door to door to pick up on warrants. I mean, you guys knew that. Yeah. So they so now they're going around picking up some of your employees. And a majority of the cases is that case I just explained. They're picking up guys that owe child support in arrears to the state of Michigan. Do that make sense? So when, we, when, we, when they plaster the kid on television, they're saying this kid is not being fed, this kid doesn't have a place to stay, that's not necessarily true because the state of Michigan through different federal agencies, and they're, they're paying for a place for these kids to stay, they're paying for them to have food, Dozens of resources of places to get other things. Not saying that they should have to do that, right? But they are there because the father is still paying back the state of Michigan for those services, right? So when you show up to his house and lock him up while he's standing there with his children, the same children that he's paying child support, that's not helping nobody in our community. No one. 
So, but unless he hear from the employer, right, and hear from people from housing, not maybe until then do it really rings a bell. And I'm gonna tell you, he's a good guy. He, he you know, he will, he will, you know, give you his argument. But yet, and still, he still need to hear from people like yourself who have to process some of that. Because to to them, they just sending the paperwork out. You know how that goes. <laughs> you know, they sending it out. There's something that uh, when we get a participant in that, uh, and, and I'm sitting across from them, and I'm saying, listen, you know, sometimes you have to have a job. You have to find a means by which to, you know, start a business and in a good way have a little hustle, right? So we're talking about the opportunity to not only have, and, and I'll say this right up front, I'm going to just be 100 with you guys, right? So I'll tell them, I says, you may have your, your child support job. Right. And your business that is going to be talking about, you know, giving you the opportunity to create profits for yourself. All right. And then you can bring your kid into the business to do work for you. And there are some all kind of taxation possibilities from that. Right. In a good way. And then, you know, you do something in a good way on your hustle. What have you learned? Have you gone over to uh, GRCC and learn how to build some stuff? Right. So that you can you can build my deck or something. Right. And get uh, some money for that. So we have the opportunity, you know, when we're talking with folks, is to tell them that, look, you may have to do more than just the typical what you think about, all right? You talk about being creative. Get all three of those things, you're gonna work a lot, but you can take care of all of those issues. And to your point on um, you know, the, the paperwork part of it, you know, I teach entrepreneurship after I leave the Urban League every night, and one of the young ladies that was in my class, her business is just doing EEOC and paperwork type stuff. Now that's her business. So if she can provide a service to someone that doesn't have time to do it, then it does something for her entrepreneurship. It obviously helps you as an employer, and then everybody can be happy in that, in that regard. So I'll be more than happy to talk with you about um, those opportunities. All right, thanks. Do we have more time, Andy, or um, any more questions? I, I'm just I have one quick, I guess, if anyone could just quickly sum up what, the, the, what I see, you know, change, we've talked a lot about changing our mindset and all these uh, connections, making connections, and then to sex, su successfully execute um, uh, employment path and in, in, in whether it's returning citizens or other barriers that exist um, for individuals into successful employment. Um, that's so much needed in the construction industry. Um, what, does anyone have any last words, comments on specifically to, um, in the HBA community, it, it, there's a lot of uh, people like that, that just spoke up that, you know, single entrepreneurs, no HR department, less than 10 employees, maybe less than 20 employees, um, n not larger companies. Um, and any any la last words on, on how to successfully implement um, and, and make this work? There's something that, that John Van Elst and I always talk about. You know, we talk about action. Right? We hear a lot of meet, we go to a lot of meetings, we hear a lot of narrative and conversations about what we want to do. But then at the end of the day, what are we actually putting in play? What can we leave a room with as a means by which to say, we can address this problem with that smart person over to the left or right? We can address all these different issues. I think if we decide we're going to connect the dots, right? And before we leave a r the room, we can have an action plan. To, to address whatever issue just came up. So I think doing more of that, taking everyone, the, you know, kind of the wisdom of the room approach, right? And then just putting it all together and saying we can solve this and have something to take out of the room that day. So that would be a recommendation that I could give. Awesome, thanks. Uh, Ward and then Kerry. Yeah, on my side, I, I would encourage you to uh, take advantage of uh, uh, working with the uh, parole agents and also with our employment counselors. I mean, there's just a, a, a lot of programs out there that we have. Um, we're doing things a little bit differently. Um, and your employee shouldn't have to miss work to go report to his parole agent. So we're looking at doing things where we got parole agents working odd hours at times so that they can, they can meet with them outside of work. Um, we have some larger employers that we actually have parole officers set up with the, at the employer's shop so that when the employee goes on break, they go up and meet with their parole agent while they're at work. I mean, no one knows what's going on. They think that person's part of HR. I mean, there's a lot of other programs out there that you, know, you can take advantage of um, 
that we're offering uh, with this. And I, I would encourage everybody to to do that. I mean, we, we have funds out there where we're paying for we're paying for job coaches. We're paying for mentors. We're paying people. And the reason we're doing this is, I mean, my new motto is anything but thirty three thousand dollars. I mean, if I have to pay for a life coach, if I got to help pay to get this person back and forth to work, at the end of the day, it's cheaper than an incarceration rate. And mm -hmm. nobody wants to admit it or not, but if you pay taxes, you pay part of the incarceration rate. So I would just you know, encourage you to take advantage of, of this stuff, and it doesn't cost you anything as an employer. So right. that's why I'm encouraging employers to you know, if things are starting to go a little bit sideways, make that phone call to the parole agent. Because like I said, you, you're going to have a good employee for two years. I can guarantee it. Because if they don't, they got to go back to prison. Mm -hmm. So, and at the end of two years, you should have had, uh, they should have conformed to what it is that your, you know, your, your culture at your organization within two years of being there, they should be conformed at that point. So that's what I would close with, thanks. All right, Carrie, then John, and then we'll wrap up. I just wanna say, we've, as 32.2, we are business leaders who are doing this work. So if you have any questions from the CEO perspective, ask me. Um, I've got something like 100 CEOs that could easily talk to you or address your questions. I also have resources, including an employment lawyer, um, that at no charge will answer some of your questions. I have access to all of these services that we have up here if you have a specific question or concern about a specific employee. But that being said, the liability factor is not a factor. The risk factor is not a factor. Take a chance, have a heart. Um, use your head, the business case is there for hiring for these employees, but also understand that if you're doing background checks, that you're doing them with a reputable source. Um, there are some out there that will report even when people have been arrested, and you're gonna see when they were arrested, but maybe never charged. So understand what you're looking at and what the charges actually mean, because they may be completely, um, they may be completely not significant to your business whatsoever. All right. Okay. Thanks, Gary. John? Uh, just be attentional if you're ready to connect outside the box. We all work with people that are looking for an opportunity. We do have a skilled workforce in this area. You guys are, are looking for that skilled workforce. We work every day with people that are looking for that opportunity. So be attentional and reach out. And like my friend Randy said, action. You know, higher ed, we love meetings. We have them a lot. <laughs> and, uh, but we really love action, too, because that's when we move this community. Great. Well, thanks to everyone on the uh, panel here for the, the, the wisdom in the room. Um, amazing work that, that you're all doing, and um, thanks a lot for the collaboration and the discussion. Um, Andy, do you have any closing uh, words? Just some uh, housekeeping first, um, and just a few comments and observations. First of all, thank you again to all the panel. I encourage you to stay for the next session as well, because that's really what's I'm really, really uh, thrilled to see the interaction. I love the trading of the card already. It's just very cool, and thank you, Mike, for hosting us and, and leading by example mm -hmm. at Zealand Lumber. I think that's exactly what it is, taking those chances. You, know, you mentioned better, this is what, we have better problems. I think we also have better opportunities right now. Absolutely. And I know some of you probably know Birgit Close from the right place, who I've known in the past. And she always said, the best social job is a good paying, I mean, the best social program is a good paying job with benefits. Here in this, and I think we've all demonstrated, I don't care, that's a very nonpartisan statement. I think here's an opportunity for, for us to really help not only our businesses, but help our community. So again, thank you to the panel. We're gonna take and come back at about 10.15, which means we're a little late, but grab some coffee, hit the restrooms, and uh, see you back here in just a few minutes. <laughs>